everyone uh, for being here today and welcome to this event on accountability for trafficking in situations of conflict on behalf of the International Human Rights Clinic at Duke Law, the Center for International and Comparative Law, the International Law Society, and the Human Rights Law Society. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers in the order in which they'll speak today, then invite them each to give a presentation of 10 to 12 minutes on the topic, and then open up to questions from all of you. Hopefully we can have a really rich discussion. Um, so our first speaker is Professor Jane Huckerby, who is a clinical professor of law and director of the International Human Rights Clinic here at Duke Law. Our next speaker is Sofia Coelho Candeas, who is a judicial affairs officer with the UN team of experts on the rule of law and sexual violence in conflict. Uh, our third speaker is Lauren Ahrens, who is the head of the gender team in the Gender, Racial Justice, Refugees, and Migrants program at Amnesty International. And then our final speaker to wrap it all up will be Professor Siobhan Mullally, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons, especially Women and Children, and the established Professor of Human Rights Law and Director of the Irish Center for Human Rights at the School of Law at the University of Galway. So Professor Huckabee, if you'd like to start us off with an introduction to the topic. Great. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, this panel is timed very deliberately um, to follow on from the presentation last week at the UN General Assembly of the UN Special Rapporteur's report um, on trafficking and accountability in conflict settings. And that was a report presented to the UN General Assembly on this topic that involved interactive dialogue around um, the rapporteur's key findings. So my role is, again, to be very basic and introductory uh, on the topic. So I'm just going to lay out a few points around um, why the Duke International Human Rights Clinic um, became interested and involved in supporting the mandate of the rapporteur on this topic. Um, and just a couple of the key challenges in thinking about accountability for trafficking in conflict-related settings. So the big, big picture starting point is that there have, uh, have been and continue to be multiple acts of human trafficking uh, that occur in different types of conflict and post-conflict settings. So they can be trafficking uh, for labour, uh, they can be trafficking for sexual exploitation, trafficking for forced marriage, trafficking for slavery, uh, they can be trafficking of adults and of, of children. Um, and the trafficking can occur both before, during and after conflict when people are fleeing conflict settings. It can also occur in both international and non-international armed conflict to track our understanding of how we classify conflict under international law. There has been increasing attention in the international community to the prevalence and the patterns of trafficking that are linked to conflict, um, in particularly um, recent conflicts in Ethiopia and in Ukraine have brought renewed focus to how existing forms of trafficking and vulnerabilities um, are exacerbated before, during and after conflict. It's also been increasing attention to really being deliberate about targeting the different stakeholders who are engaged in trafficking persons, many of which is what we refer to as state, like governmental stakeholders, but also increasingly non-state actors that perpetrate um, abuses that constitute trafficking in persons. So think, for example, of trafficking by prescribed groups like ISIS or Boko Haram. Um, think about the role of corporations um, in trafficking in persons too. But despite this increased um, attention, despite the increased recognition of the prevalence and patterns of trafficking in persons, what has been really stark has been the extraordinary absence of genuine accountability um, for that. And that means legal accountability that we think about in terms of prosecutions against perpetrators, but it also means accountability in a broader sense, which under human rights law we define as being prevention um, and protection and assistance to victims. And so, again, we have this extraordinary disconnect between increased patterns, increased recognition, and then a pretty resolute lack of accountability for what is acknowledged to be an extraordinary human rights violation. So... That was the entry point um, for the clinic when um, the mandate of uh, Shimon Malali, the Social Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons, Special Women and Children, really has had ongoing work on this topic for many years, but was also very much animated by this question of how do we solve this gap, right, this extraordinary impunity gap between the practice and the lack of redress uh, for trafficking in persons. And so the clinic um, supported the mandate um, pr primarily by um, hosting a convening um, earlier um, in, in the year in The Hague that was co-hosted by Duke, um, the mandate 
um, and also the IDLO um, that convened around 100 stakeholders. Um, and I'll talk about why we did that and, and what the function of that convening was. But it was really to bring together people who work on this question from very different perspectives to try and see if we could shed light on why these gaps were occurring despite a pretty robust international law framework available to it. Um, so maybe just a couple of things, and I'm just going to be very big picture here on what the big challenges are in this space, um, and then maybe hopefully we can get a chance to explore that more fully um, throughout our panel and our Q&A. But definitely we encountered, I think I'll give you five major challenges. There are many more, but five will be enough to get us thinking about these questions in, in, a, in a, a particularly targeted way. Um, the first challenge was there was a deep normative confusion and practical confusion over how to define trafficking in persons. So we have a very clear, universally, globally used definition um, in a document called the UN Trafficking Protocol. Um, it's got a longer title, but that's a short way that we refer to it. And that tells us very clearly that you can, if you're an adult, if you have been subject to an act by a certain means with an intent to exploit for sexual labour or other exploitation, then you are trafficked under international um, anti-trafficking law. So that's a definition that is used at the international level and in most, almost all domestic governments use that definition. The definition may, also makes very clear that children don't have to show a means by which they're trafficked. All we have to show is that a kid has a certain act committed against them with an intent to exploit. And that's because children can't consent to their own exploitation, right? So even if we have deception and fraud and so forth, it's, like, it's totally irrelevant if we have a kid who's been groomed by a terrorist group or an armed group in conflict or by a state, um, then we don't look at the means by which it happens. We look at was there an act with an intent to exploit. But what we found is that basically there's a lot of confusion over that, what that means. Um, in particular, uh, did there need to be an economic component to the exploitation? The answer is no, but sometimes there's confusion among practitioners about that being required. What we also found interesting and, and, and challenging, and the rapporteur um, addresses this very squarely in, in, in her report to the GA that was presented last week, is that this is for everyone, all the lawyers and future lawyers in the room, is that even though we had this very coherent definition of trafficking in persons pursuant to the trafficking um, protocol, there was some confusion about how that migrated into other areas of international law. So, for example, international criminal law, international humanitarian law, international human rights law, there's less confusion there. Those are all laws that apply to armed conflict and apply to trafficking in persons. But how we take that definition that we use all the time in human rights, that we use all the time in trafficking, and put it into IHL, put it into national criminal law, was a, a point of contention. In particular, because the relevant um, instruments that define international criminal law and international humanitarian law don't explicitly criminalise trafficking as a separate offence, right? They may criminalise, for example, rape. They criminalise enforced disappearances. They criminalise um, slavery. But they don't have that specific criminalisation of trafficking in persons in their regime, which makes it hard to know how to use the definition that we all use elsewhere. Um, and the result is that very often um, there are things that we would classify as human rights lawyers as trafficking in persons, but our colleagues in international criminal law, IHL, just maybe weren't making that connection between what they were seeing and, and the trafficking definition. And I'll just give, let me give one example, um, is the forcible transfer of children. Um, so we have reports and there is currently an indictment um, issued by the ICC um, against various Russian authorities for the transfer of children from Ukraine to Russia. And that indictment, if you look at it, it's very brief, you can, you can look at it, essentially classifies those uh, as international criminal activities, but doesn't use the word trafficking. Um, whereas under an international anti-trafficking framework, we would call that trafficking 101. Okay, the definition is a big one. The second big challenge is addressing the intersectionality of people's experiences. So what we found is that there was a really insufficient account of how people in conflict, as they do in peacetime, have differentiated experiences of conflict. That can be along race, it can be along class, it can be along gender, age, and other, other lines. And very often there wasn't an attention to how those differentiated positions affected vulnerability to trafficking in persons and affected your ability to access regions redress afterward. Um, the third point that I mentioned already, but I want to really um, bring out as a legal challenge, was really um, it is very easy when you work in international law to become a specialist in one area. Um, it's much harder to get everyone to come together and develop a common approach to thinking about how to knit together international criminal law, international humanitarian law, international human rights law, international refugee law, international anti trafficking law. And very often the expertise in those spaces is very siloed. Um, and so a lot of um, the effort here has been to say, 
if we have a situation where we have multiple bodies of law that apply, right? If trafficking in armed conflict implicates up to five, if not more, areas of international law, and our situation is that people are not getting any accountability, then we need to do better at working together with the system to see how they can be complementary and how they can be brought to, to put to bear. And so a lot of what the rapporteur's work has done and what her report does is actually tell us and tell stakeholders, including governments, including the UN, including practitioners, how to use trafficking norms under international criminal law, like for example. So if you have someone who's been prosecuted who's a child soldier, um, who then went on to commit crimes, you know, we would also, that, could, that has an international criminal law framework applicable to it, but also has a very strong anti-trafficking framework of, of, applicable to it um, as well. The final um, two challenges that I'll mention is we, and I think hopefully I've caught some of our colleagues will reflect on this too, is there are a lot of fact-finding challenges when thinking about documentation of trafficking in armed conflict um, <coughs> settings. So this can be issues of access to victims. Uh, it can also be questions about victims not identifying as such. Um, and that's particularly the case where people are recruited into armed groups. Um, they may not identify as trafficking victims um, as such. Um, there's also um, challenges around very often the mandate of an investigatory mechanism um, may not be told to look at trafficking. <laughs> And if a mandate isn't told to look at trafficking, they will not do it. It's sort of seen as an additional burden um, to their work. And so they may, for example, be asked to like, investigate sexual violence against kids, but not then asked to see how that lines up with a trafficking definition. And without that extra impetus, that wasn't always occurring. Um, there's also a fact-finding challenge that relates to whether it's a generic challenge that may be amplified in, in this context that relates to whether you're doing fact-finding um, against the government, like so the authorities, or against a non-state actor, right? So investigatory approaches to um, how you think about trafficking by ISIS, right? Whether that be selling of Yazidi slaves, whether that be recruitment of young boys um, to participate in terrorist activities, that contains certain fact-finding challenges um, that maybe can be impediment to trafficking in persons. The final point that I'll add, and this is more of a strategic um, challenge um, in this space, and again, something to think about as, as lawyers and, and human rights advocates, is when, we, when you have multiple frameworks that are available to make sense of a situation, right? When you can think about, okay, how can I um, analyze forced marriage to an armed group member? Okay, that's my challenge. You have to really think about, and this is a bit crude, but I will articulate it like as such, you know, but what is the value add of an anti-trafficking framework? Like, why would I use that um, as opposed to using an international criminal law framework or of slavery um, or an international humanitarian law framework of rape and other gender-based violence? Like, why do I need to bring an anti-trafficking framework? And that was something that I would say that I had not anticipated um, fully would be an issue in, in engaging with stakeholders. I thought that was quite obvious, but that was very much a stumbling block um, in some of the work that we've been doing of trying to show how bringing this framework, even though it requires a lot of expertise, um, would actually further the accountability agenda that each stakeholder was pursuing. And there are a couple of different things, and we can reflect on this maybe in, in Q&A, but definitely like thinking about... Um, the ways in which the anti-trafficking framework, um, one of the value adds, and again, I'm putting that very uncomfortably, like in, a, in inverted comments, but a value add is that it really requires us to look at prevention. Um, so very often an international criminal law accountability model is very much after the fact, right, after a violation, whereas human rights law and anti-trafficking law require us to take a holistic approach to prevention um, and to accountability and so forth. Um, human rights frameworks also require you to look at the rights of the victims. Right? So very often, if you think about a legal accountability framework from an ICL, international criminal law perspective, although they've gotten better on this, it tends to be very perpetrator-focused. You know, it's not really thinking through, like, what would this look like for victims? Like, what would a right to remedy look like for a victim, like, in this particular regard? Um, and I can talk more about that later on in the Q&A if you're interested in thinking this through as a strategic point as to how do you emphasise value add of, of a binding legal framework. Um, those are just a couple of big picture um, things to think about as we go through our discussion. Great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we'll turn to you now, Sophia. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. After three years doing that, you never learn. <laughs> uh, um, so, um, 
Well, first of all, thank you very much for having us in this discussion. Um, we participated in the Hague conference, which was um, an incredible event. So thank you very much to Duke for doing that. I think it was um, it paved the way to a lot of discussions that happened after. So we also welcome the, the report of the special rapporteur who arrived at a very good time to uh, crown these discussions in a more formal way and also opening the doors for, a, for new activities. And I think when we were asked to participate in the, in the round table, we were asked about the importance of the report and how was it useful for the work of the team of experts? Um, maybe just for parenthesis background, the UN team of experts is a, is a team established by the Security Council of the UN uh, in 2009. The mandate of the team is to provide technical support to member states in the promotion of rule of law and accountability of the rule of law response to conflict related sexual violence. Um, when the work of the team started, um, the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Sexual Violence in Conflict um, worked around conflict-related sexual violence, but trafficking was not originally included as such in the definition of sexual violence in conflict. It started to be included um, in 2015 as a result of the adoption um, and 2016 as a result of the adoption of the Security Council resolutions 2331 and, and later on 2388. That came again um, as a response to the events that were happening um, uh, very much around ISIS and Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. um, but as if you read the resolutions, you will see that beyond these so-called terrorist groups, um, the resolutions also make uh, reference to non-state armed groups mm -hmm. that had engaged in trafficking before, like the LRA. And I think that it's important to have this in mind as we advance the discussion. And I think the, the report of the special rapporteur sheds light on the importance of looking at trafficking perpetrated by not only by terrorist groups, but also by non-state armed groups and the promotion of accountability. So um, I, I won't talk a lot. I will talk very much about the work that we do, but how is the report important for, for us, UN, um, but also for member states who are engaged and committed to address this issue? And I think one of the, one of the, the, the main contribute, one of the first contributions that we, we would like to signal is to address the invisibility of trafficking for the purpose of sexual violence in conflict in the context of conflict. So trafficking in the context of conflict. Trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation has been identified as part of the modus operandi of many non-state armed groups and as part of the conflict, but because it is trafficking and um, as you said, as you very rightly said, it's siloed. So it was a tra it was a crime before, and people who worked in international humanitarian law or in conflict related areas, because trafficking existed before and it will exist after, it has been siloed and not necessarily acknowledged as something that exists in conflict and needs to be addressed in conflict. And in fact, it's magnified and increases during conflict. So this is something that I think that the report is essential to remind us. I think there are the normative framework has evolved in the last years, but addressing this invisibility is key. Um, if you read the annual report of the Secretary General uh, of last year, you will see that um, the Secretary General has highlighted uh, trafficking for the purpose of sexual violence in conflict contexts um, in um, CAR, DRC, Libya, Ukraine, South Sudan, Somalia, and Mozambique, and Syria. Of course, that immediately after acknowledging it, we also, the, the, the Secretary General also notes the um, incredible um, or total lack of accountability for this specific crime. And of course that, again, the report sheds light into this. Um, and I think that 
it goes beyond because usually when we look at trafficking as currently described in the 2331 and the 2388 we look at trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation and sexual slavery in conflict um very much as part of the strategic objectives and i'll read the definition that is in the 2331 um can be part of strategic objectives and ideology and used as a tactic by certain terrorist groups, uh, incentivizing recruitment, supporting financing through the sale, trade and trafficking of women, girls and boys, destroying, punishing, subjugating or controlling communities, displacing population from strategically important zones, extracting information for intelligence purposes, um, advancing ideology. And so this is in a way, if, if we were to think that trafficking for the purpose of sexual violence in conflict, it could be only limited to this. What we've seen and um, in the last years, and I think that the report is very important because I think I haven't seen a lot of UN documents um, um, enumerating the terms, the types of conflict-driven trafficking for the purpose of sexual violence and the special rapporteur identifies the um, exploitation of those displaced by conflict mm -hmm. exploitation as part of the generalized sgbv that characterizes conflict areas and exploitation associated with the increased demand for sexual services that often emerge in conflict affected areas conflict driven trafficking for the purpose of sexual violence and this nexus to conflict to include these behaviors hasn't been really uh, discussed openly it, and it's not not openly but hasn't been discussed and we think it is this can be an important contribution of, of, of the report to again open the door for discussion about the concept um the special rapporteur also talks about cases that may amount to sexual slavery. Again, this has been um, thoroughly discussed, but we do think that as we enumerate the types of, um, and of course, this is not an exclusive list, but we do think that it is important to bring this uh, terms to the discussion. Um, so this is the first point on how the report has been important on addressing the invisibility of the crime and um, obliging us to really rethink what falls under this conflict-driven uh, trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation and sexual violence. Secondly, the report looks at the accountability gaps and how and the causes for um, these accountability gaps. What we've seen um, in the exercise of the mandate, and as we've tried to improve the technical response to um, conflict-driven trafficking, we find very much the same challenges in addressing trafficking that we encounter when we uh, look at the challenges for addressing conflict-related sexual violence. As you go through the list, you'll find many commonalities. Um, you'll find a reluctance of the victim survivor to self-identify you find stigma, stigma related to sexual violence, but also stigma related usually to the affiliation or association with the group or the perpetrator of the crime. You encounter fear of retaliation. Um, you encounter um, generally an absence of an adequate state response to ensure access to victim-centered assistance. Um, an access uh, to information and adequate complaint procedures um, and, a and a lack of state efforts to refer victims and survivors to safe pathways that will allow them to um, access justice, not to oblige them to access justice, but for them to make an informed choice to access justice if that is their desire. And these are things, and if, if I wasn't in a conflict, uh, if I wasn't in a trafficking discussion and I was in a purely sexual violence discussion, this would resonate with everyone in the conversation. 
the, the, um, I think that we will, I will talk a little bit about the technical work and how we try to address this or work with member states who are willing to, to, to do it and how we can do this in practice. Regarding the, the accountability gap and the challenges, there's a second point, of course, that also comes through in the report, which is the legislative framework. Um, of course, that national courts tra as traditionally have used the Palermo Protocol and the definition of the Palermo Protocol usually um, implemented and, uh, and uh, integrated in their own national laws, um, as well as provisions in their um, national penal codes. Um, of course, that the use of provisions, and I think this has been a point uh, made often by the, the special representatives, by the special representative, is that um, we should have a comprehensive use of all available provisions to ensure accountability. So we should try to u make use of relevant provisions of international criminal law, international humanitarian law, and national law, and because they are compatible and they should be used in a way that provides the broadest redress for person for victims and survivors with no constraints which maybe it's something that practitioners and lawyers have a lot because we lot we like very much to have our own boxes and sometimes we like to tick our own boxes instead of um rethinking about what are the boxes that would better serve victims and survivors? Um, the office has uh, launched two years ago model penal legislation that could be used by uh, member states in order to improve their own um, uh, national legal framework. Um, one of the things that comes through in the report and has been the subject of a long discussion in other forum has been the fact that trafficking has not really been considered by everyone um, a crime, um, under inter an offense under international criminal law and uh, prosecuted by international courts. Um, when we did the model penal legislation, um, um, it was, there was an attempt to address this gap. So, and I'll put it in the chat, the model penal legislation. So there are two provisions that basically um, so a model provision um, 14 and model provision 32 basically consider trafficking in purpose in persons for the purpose of sexual violence and or exploitation as a form of enslavement as a war crime and trafficking in purpose in persons uh, for the purpose of sexual violence as a form of enslavement as a crime against humanity. And to the ones who are familiar with the Rome Statute and with the not very clear uh, integration of trafficking in the current definition, this may resonate to you. I think that the advantage of this, of this provision as currently phrased is that trafficking is an offense in itself and it's not conduct subsumed in another offense that somehow kind of almost uh, downgrades the, the, its importance. Uh, and I see, I know that I'm running out of time, so I, I'll, I'll finish um, by um, just going, giving you a little bit of an idea of what the team is currently doing that we hope very much aligns with the recommendations provided by the special rapporteur. Um, and uh, so we have currently three main activities ongoing. Um, we have um, um, a large... Um, research um, slash practical project ongoing and that addresses two of the things that um, Monica um, uh, outlined in her presentation. The first one is the lack of conceptual and legal clarity regarding the use of the term trafficking as conflict related sexual violence. This is of course of particular importance to us. Um, there is this uh, loose description or loose term of conflict uh, of uh, trafficking as conflict related sexual violence um trafficking in persons and sexual violence in conflict were 
individually and separately developed, having their own substantive and important normative content that should not be ignored. So the current work that we are doing is basically to ensure um, an examination and analysis of all the normative instruments that would allow us to gain a better understanding of all the rights and obligations arising from the multitude of uh, normative instruments that have addressed both crimes. Then there is also a lack of understanding about um, how to implement these rights and obligations. Um, and the idea is that after, when this project is concluded, we will gain, again, clarity about the concept, but also clarity about what are the rights and obligations and how they can be implemented. Hopefully, this is a project that will be concluded um, um, by in uh, early uh, in the first quarter of 2024, and we will have a workshop to discuss it. It's another discussion, and uh, which is very important in UN terms, but it's also very important because we do think that it is important to do policy and advocacy that is informed by practitioners and by grounded research. And this is something that we have, um, that we have not found addressing this specific topic enough. Um, and we hope that this will also inform our own technical work on the ground. Um, we do have a second project that is very focused on criminal accountability and basically here the idea is to develop um, pilot trainings um, for investigators and prosecutors of specific member states that have um, encountered um, trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation and sexual violence in the context of conflict. Um, this is a very specific project. Um, in we are, we have a limited number of states that have expressed interest um, in uh, where this project can be piloted. Just a word of um, question: of, of course, that we don't think that it is enough to do trainings for prosecutors. There's no lack of trainings and prosecutors for prosecutors. It's also it's a matter also of policy and political will. So if we are to engage in a pilot project with a, a member state and maybe to to do some kind of strategic litigation that at least we can pave the way to to start with to to have new forms of accountability, um, which is the ultimate objective of the strategic litigation and to catalyze more action from prosecutors, it needs to be a work end on end with judicial actors and with political actors. So when we talk about criminal accountability for conflict driven trafficking, the idea of the team and the, the, the way we operate is always to try to combine three pillars, the political will, and for that, if we want to have criminal accountability and prosecutions, we need to develop a policy that, has, that is endorsed and support, supported by political actors. We need to work at the technical level. And working at the technical level, it's not only about creating offenses, but also securing evidence, securing uh, mutual and legal assistance and cooperation. And then it's work with civil society. There is, for this type of crimes, there is absolutely no way that we can gain access and that we can enable trust of victims and survivors to come forward and to provide information if we don't work very closely with civil society. Um, so this is how um, we are thinking about what we've read in the Special Rapporteur uh, report. Um, it's new to us, so it's very new. I think there's a lot more to explore, but um, um, we think that it is um, there. There's a world of possibilities to explore and to improve the work in this area. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sophia. And we'll turn it over to Lauren for civil society perspective. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, first of all, to the special rapporteur for this uh, really excellent report and to Duke for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, I'm going 
perhaps mostly on the challenges identifying trafficking victims in conflict and, and really how crucial this is as a first step to justice and accountability. Um, as I read that, it's just a really, really important thread and a really relevant one to us coming through the Special Rapporteur's report. Um, and I think in, in doing that, I'll be picking up on some of Jane's comments about the normative and practical confusion, which I, which I also recognise, um, and the invisibility that um, Sophia mentioned as well. Um, but I, I'm hoping to start with an example. I've been doing some work um, with colleagues in Amnesty over the last couple of years, looking at um, trafficking in northeast Syria. Um, and I'm sure most of you will know um, in terms of the background, but in 2019, ISIS was defeated from the last piece of territory it controlled in northeast Syria. Um, and it was defeated by a Kurdish-led group, the Syrian Democratic Forces, with the support of uh, US Global Coalition. And at this time, as, as many of you might also know, there was a really large outflow of people from, from this bit of territory. There were tens of, of thousands of people who fled or were forced out. Um, and the Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF, who were an armed group and their allies, pretty much saw everyone that was leaving as a perceived ISIS uh, pretty much perceived everyone as an ISIS member and took everyone to prison-like camps or detention facilities where most of these tens of, th of thousands of people still are. One thing they did do, though, that has been incredibly important was that they did look for people that they knew had been held captive by ISIS, um, particularly women, girls, and boys from the Yazidi community that they knew had been enslaved by ISIS, and they really tied back to Iraq. But beyond that, um, they really weren't interested in screening people in adequate ways. So here's the example I wanted to go to. We've spoken to scores and scores of people um, who are detained in the camps, um, the prison-like camps or the, the detention facilities. And, and I just want to give an example of, of one of the people I spoke to who was a non-Yazidi woman at an, that we've been working to document. But she told me how she was married when she was 11. Her father forced her to marry a foreign national ISIS fighter. Uh, this was in Iraq because he really wanted to get in with ISIS. Um, and she described basically being transferred from an incredibly abusive father to then be in an awful relationship with her so-called husband, full of coercion, abuse and violence. Um, and she was only 15 or so when the last bit of ISIS territory fell and they came out, um, her and her husband together, and were sort of picked up by the Syrian Democratic Forces. And she was pregnant at the time. And because she was so young, because she was pregnant, because her you know, so-called husband was so much older, the Syrian Democratic Forces um, that picked her up wrongly believed she was Yazidi. So they took her and they took her husband and she says that they beat her husband to try and get him to admit that she was Yazidi. But he wouldn't admit that she wasn't Yazidi. And, and they eventually realized she wasn't Yazidi. And when they realized she wasn't Yazidi, that was sort of really it in terms of their interest in her. They did after that what they normally do to people. They, they took the husband, the so-called husband, to, to a prison facility. And they took her, even though she was only 15 or so, um, and they knew about her circumstances, they took her to one of these prison-like camps where, where she's been since. And I want to explain why I'm telling you this story or why I think it's so important. Um, I, I, again, just want to agree with one of the key points in the Special Rapporteur's report, um, that really one of the first failures in accountability is about failing to identify trafficking victims in the first place. Um, so this woman was a trafficking victim. When she was a girl, she was recruited or harbored and harbored by a member of an armed group for exploitative purposes, including forced marriage and, and sexual exploitation. Um, her husband um, was the perpetrator of, um, or at least one of the perpetrators of, of this trafficking, uh, but it wasn't recognized as such. Um, and this, this is just one example, and, and there's, there's at least hundreds, possibly thousands of similar cases in, in the camps in Northeast Syria. Um, but the failure to identify has, has just led to a situation where there are hundreds, possibly thousands of people who were trafficked in effectively detention facilities, be they camps or prisons in northeast Syria, who are not being protected as they need to be and not getting justice. Um, and also, you know, many thousands of perpetrators 
is potentially or, or it, who are in uh, the custody of uh, this armed group and others, their allies who, who are not being prosecuted or investigated or prosecuted for trafficking. So this sort of original failure to screen and identify even years later has led to this massive, massive vacuum um, in being able to ensure the rights of, of trafficking victims on the one hand or to prosecute and bring to justice the, the perpetrators on, on the other hand. Um, and this this is something we're seeing really clearly in our documentation work in, in northeast Syria, but it, it's not alone. This is something we have seen in other places. Um, the office, uh, Sophia's office, the office of the SRSG on, on sexual uh, violence and conflict, um, has documented similar cases. And, and we've documented patterns, for example, in Nigeria, where we know that women coming out of areas controlled by armed groups aren't screened, aren't recognized as trafficking survivors. Many of them may end up in detention um, instead of assistance and justice, um, and their perpetrators are not prosecuted. So maybe just to add um, my voice to Sophia's to say I, I really recognize, uh, so I really value as well the, the work of the special rapporteur to set out so concretely in, can look like in, in context the call for more training of personnel to be able to identify um, to be able to identify trafficking victims. Um, I think it's really clear that what we see in peacetime, we see even more starkly in conflict context that those who really do need to be able to identify trafficking victims to ensure their protection and, and for the purposes of counter. And it's not just about members of armed forces um, and armed groups, but we're also seeing police prosecutors, judges, and so many others are failing to recognize trafficking victims. Um, and, and so those, those recommendations in that regard are really useful to us and, and we'll be using them. Um, I, I want to maybe just pivot from here before I conclude to just reflect a little bit on our own work um, and how valuable this is for us. Um, and, and how this report and, and the conversations that have led to it have encouraged us to be more reflective on our own work um, on the issue of needing to identify um, trafficking patterns much more in our, our fact-finding work. So the special rapporteur, one of the recommendations in the report, sorry, in the special rapporteur's report, uh, is calling on UN investigative mechanisms a mandate and fact-finding bodies to um, investigate trafficking. More. That's a recommendation to the UN, but but I think one that also invites broader civil society groups uh, like ourselves as Amnesty to, to to reflect on as well. And I think there's much more we can we can all be doing in this regard. Um, I can speak mostly as as um, Amnesty's work on on gender justice issues and women's rights because that's that's where I work, but. You know, Amnesty has done some work in the past on trafficking in conflict context. We issued, when I was looking, a, re a really big report from um, some years back on Kosovo looking at trafficking in conflict. But there hasn't been so much more recently that's um, really identified and articulated trafficking um, as a human rights violation um, among the concerns documented. And, and I also agree with Sophia, and I've been sort of, you know, one of the key issues, as, as Jane also mentioned, is, is just the massive, massive challenges in being able to to document trafficking in conflict context um and i agree with all of the points sophia was was raising before um but yeah I, I also think there's much more we can be doing in making sure that when we have documented fact patterns that constitute trafficking uh when we have documented them and analyzed them or um framed them as war crimes or crimes under international law um there's much more we can be doing to also recognize them as trafficking um, and pull in the human rights trafficking framework in that regard. And I, yeah, I think I think there's much more that we can be doing. Um, I would say in the, in the last few years, we have started to become much more thoughtful about that. Mm -hmm. So we issued a report on conflict related sexual violence in Ethiopia earlier this year. And within that and part of that, we analyzed a pattern of abuses by the Eritrean armed forces um that we analyzed and concluded likely um amounted to trafficking um and although i think we could have been much stronger in in some ways in that report and um, called for accountability um for those acts 
Um, and as I mentioned at the start, we're doing this big piece of work now on, on trafficking in Northeast Syria. So I, I hope that's sort of the beginning of, of us and um, yeah, really sort of working more consistently to document trafficking in, in conflict context. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lauren, both for that sort of self-reflection and also for the very striking, I think, example to really um, make the issues more clear to folks at the beginning. Uh, Switch Rapporteur Malali, we'll turn it over to you to share a bit more of your perceptions of the report and where you're hoping to go in the future with this work. Um, thank you very much, Monica, um, and thank you to Jane and to Aya and to all of the team at the Duke International Human Rights Law Clinic. Um, I really want to express my gratitude for the work that the Duke International Human Rights Law Clinic um, has undertaken in supporting the mandate for several years now, and in particular in preparation and in the consultations and in the reflection and conceptualization of the report um, just presented last week to the third committee of the General Assembly. But I guess most importantly, in thinking about the background around why this work was needed, um, what might be possible to contribute, uh, and in supporting the work of the mandate so expertly in bringing together different key actors um, and there was a great team of students who worked uh, with Jane and, and Monica and Aya and uh, it was really I, I think quite groundbreaking work mm -hmm. um, really important we had the two days of workshops in The Hague um, and Sophia and Lauren have already um, commented on that and, and Jane in her opening comments but for many I think and for me and, and others there it was really quite a unique opportunity to reflect in depth on why there was still relative invisibility in practice in relation to ensuring accountability with regard to trafficking in situations of conflict. And that is despite the significant developments in the normative frameworks, mm -hmm. um, despite the adoption of Security Council resolutions, as Sophia mentioned, um, and despite a lot of rhetoric in documents um, and references to trafficking, but in practice we saw that uh, in meeting with protection clusters, for example, in humanitarian settings, in conflict settings, in situations of displacement, that there was really very little attention given to trafficking in persons as a very high risk um, in these kinds of contexts, although it was well documented. Um, so staff, humanitarian actors, those involved in peacekeeping and protection were not trained to identify the risks of trafficking or those who may be victims of trafficking. Mm -hmm. And that meant that the consequences were that there's a lack of prevention, most importantly, um, a lack of attention to the steps that could be taken to try to limit the risks or to identify those who were in fact victims and who needed access to protection, to assistance, to sexual and reproductive health services, to ongoing assistance, to protection against reprisals. And also quite often what we see is that victims were being punished rather than protected. So children being punished for their association with armed groups or terrorist groups and not being identified as victims of trafficking and also adults, men and, and women who had been forcibly recruited um, but were not identified as victims. And the lack of accountability we also see in the impunity within which trafficking continues uh, and has developed as a strategy that is used by armed groups and other actors in situations of conflict. Mm -hmm. And in the work of my mandate on trafficking in persons, we've seen that in country visits, um, in Colombia, where Jane also joined us for a few days, uh, in South Sudan, in Tajikistan, in meeting with Afghan refugees, and in communications that the mandate publishes um, to states, for example, in relation to Ethiopia, Libya, most recently, just two weeks ago, Sudan, mm -hmm. in other engagement in Ukraine and Syria. Um, 
and, and what we're trying to highlight through this work, drawing on the work in the report as well, is the different forms of trafficking. Jane mentioned forcible transfers of children, for example, um, forced marriage and child marriage, domestic servitude, forced labour, exploitation and criminal activities. Mm -hmm. And to try to bring out how the different legal frameworks can and should apply um, to give protection and ensure accountability. And I'll also just mention um, the report presented to the Human Rights Council in June of this year, which is related in that it was about access to refugee protection, um, the protection needs of internally displaced persons and stateless persons. And again, this was to highlight that sometimes the language around prevention of trafficking is misused mm -hmm. to actually limit pathways, safe pathways to international protection. So again, it was to highlight that trafficking may be a form of persecution, may give rise to a right to seek and enjoy asylum or other forms of international protection. And to pick up on what Monica said about um, next steps and thinking about new directions, it was very interesting at the interactive dialogue with states and we had um, some students from Duke attending, which was great also. Um, what states picked up on and we had thought there might be a little bit of pushback around trying to draw out the application of international humanitarian law, for example, or international criminal law. And we didn't see that. Um, we saw a recognition of the need for more linkages in practice. Um, and also, in particular, several states picked up on the point um, that Lauren mentioned also around the recommendations to investigative mechanisms of the Human Rights Council or the Security Council and the need to understand what were the challenges in fact-finding, but also in, in employing the conceptual frameworks of the different international law regimes to apply them to trafficking. And at the consultations that Duke organised in The Hague, we actually had several of the investigative mechanisms participating. The Venezuela fact-finding mission, the Libya fact-finding mission, the international investigative mechanism for Myanmar and for Syria. And that was one of the very first times that they had come together to talk about trafficking in persons, also with officials from the International Criminal Court, in particular the Office of the Prosecutor, but also defence lawyers. Um, and there, again, what we talked about was that the fact patterns had been recognised, were being reported on, but were not being captured or recognised as trafficking in persons. And that's not just apply, about applying a label. It has consequences in terms of the kinds of protections that should be given to those who are victims, the access to justice, access to rep reparations, and the ongoing protection needs of those who are victims and survivors, as well as, of course, the continued impunity that trafficking continues to operate. Um, we talked about perhaps continuing to engage with the investigative mechanisms and also in particular with the International Criminal Court. Um, as was mentioned, the, the Rome Statute does include reference to enslavement and sexual slavery as crime against humanity or as war crimes. And there is a footnote reference in the rules and procedures around trafficking, but it hasn't been prosecuted as such. Um, and what was interesting also is what has happened is for those who may be victims, they risk being punished. Mm -hmm. So this is something that came up in the Dominic Ongwen proceedings only at appeal level. This is in relation to the Lord's Resistance Army uh, and the situation in Uganda. And that raised questions around how we might, how we should be reflecting on the treatment of mm -hmm. children associated with armed conflict or often referred to as former child soldiers and the question of their accountability, um, but also perhaps their protection needs. What's also, I think, interesting and what we need to look at are questions around the trust fund and reparations. And we have discussed um, the Assembly of States parties to the International Criminal Court, Rome Statute, We'll be meeting in December. We're hoping to have a side event uh, and to engage more with states, parties and civil society around looking at strengthening investigative processes and access to justice for victims of trafficking. I think we also need to do more. And the report highlighted this. It came up a little bit in discussions also subsequently with Colombia, 
around transitional justice processes and hybrid um, tribunals, peace building processes, the extent to which trafficking can undermine um, peace building processes because of the continued operations of armed groups, attacks on children, recruitment of children and young people, abductions from schools, and how this can be really destabilizing in a transitional phase and in a peace building phase as armed groups may link in with criminal networks. Um, and you have a proliferation and presence of small weapons and arms. So this, these are the kinds of climates within which trafficking can persist. We're also now undertaking um, work with the Office of the Secretary, Special Representative of the Secretary General on Children in Armed Conflict to look at the monitoring and reporting mechanisms on grave violations against children uh, in conflict situations and how those could capture the risks of child trafficking and incidents of child trafficking and report on those. Again, the objective being to strengthen prevention and ensure accountability. Um, and I hope, and we did some work on this last week after the report, to engage more with peace building actors, um, peacekeeping operations, but all the various UN entities engaged in peace building, including the Peace Building Commission and the Peace Building Fund, to think about the work that they need to do to ensure access to justice for victims, accountability in relation to the perpetrators, and also strengthen their prevention work to identify those who may be at risk and who are actually victims of trafficking in conflict situations. So to really, um, as the other speakers have said, to try to break down the silos and in practice, um, Ensure justice for trafficking victims. Yes. <laughs> the final thing. Yeah. We might have time for one very quick question. Hannah, go ahead. Um, thank you all for speaking today. I thought this was really interesting. Um, my question is on implementation. Mm -hmm. So for either or both the UN or civil society, how do you ensure... Um, states actually implement the recommendations you put forward and are states generally receptive to implementing these recommendations? Sorry, I dropped, I think, briefly. Yeah, so we, we turned to questions and the question was, uh, how do you go about uh, promoting or fostering implementation of your recommendations among states? Um, so we work, you have to engage in ongoing dialogue um, to meet with states, to highlight the steps that can be taken, to look at current developments, mm -hmm. and to. it's a process of continuing dialogue, meetings, taking opportunities to point out the potential for reforms, mm -hmm. to link with offices, to link with civil society, and to draft proposals for legislative and policy reform. So it's an ongoing process, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm not seeing another hand raised and we are right at time. So I want to say thank you again to our incredible speakers for joining us today for this really important and timely discussion. And thank you to everyone for joining us today as well. And we look forward to seeing you at future events.